Today is Pentecost Sunday, and could we just begin before we even uh, open the scriptures, could we just sing, O Lord, send the power just now? Can we sing that as just a, a chorus? O Lord, send the power just now. O Lord, send the power just now. O Lord, send the power just now. And Baptize everyone. Once more. Oh, Lord, send the power just now. Oh, Lord, send the power just now. Oh, Lord, send the power just now. And baptize everyone. Amen. And amen, right? Praise God. Praise God. Have you got your Bibles today? Let me see them if you have your Bibles. We're going to turn back to the Gospel of John. And the Lord, as he so often does, has particular Sundays where things are timed out well. And this is one of those. It's, it's Pentecost Sunday, and we are actually going to be looking at the role of of the Holy Spirit. And so we begin in John 14 and verse 15, and we will read through verse 21. So John 14, beginning in verse 15, Jesus speaking to his disciples. This is just before he will head out to the Garden of Gethsemane. That will be followed, of course, by the next day, him going to Calvary's cross. So this is in quite a high intensity situation. And he is talking to them and he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will ask the father and he will give you another helper, another comforter that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. In that day, you will know that I am in my father and you in me and I in you. He who has, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and I will reveal or disclose myself to him. Today we want to talk about another helper, the Holy Spirit. Another helper, the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we cannot be here and simply go through the motions and have a, uh, a ritualistic, just a meeting, uh, just because of tradition. We don't want to just go step one, step two, step three, and say that we had, quote, church, unquote. We have come to worship you, to be led of your spirit as we pray one for another, as we collectively sing songs of honor and glory to you, as we encourage one another, and as we are encouraged and taught by your word. And this is real, so I ask Today, would you by your Holy Spirit really open our minds and our hearts and allow us to see and to hear from you today? I'm reminded always, every time we come to this point in the service, that those letters to the churches in that last book of the Bible, the Revelation, that they end the same each time. Let him who hears let him, let him who sees, let him who hears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church and to the churches. And I pray now, Lord, as we have assembled here, that we would be able to hear what your Spirit would say to us today. We give you honor and thanks and praise. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen and amen. Have you ever needed counseling? And if you have, maybe more than once in life, Sometimes teachers are counselors. Sometimes, back in my day, even principals. Sometimes policemen could be counselors. But if you've 
ever needed counsel and, and you've sat with someone who's a counselor, can you think back to the person that was really the best? Do you have someone in your heart that you would say, that person was really a counselor? They really gave me genuinely great wisdom, wonderful, not just advice, but the ability to move through life. And as a Christian, hopefully, to do it God's way. Have you had that counselor? I, I hope that you have. I think many of us, if we've served the Lord for some length of time, we know someone or some people that have counseled us and helped us grow. Well, today we're going to speak about and learn about this helper that Jesus says when he goes to the Father, he will pray and another helper will come to the disciples. And so this is exciting. Um, and it's one of the greatest promises that I find in the scriptures. We start with verse 15. We finished Last week where Jesus was telling the disciples that when he does go, there's going to be a world opened up to them in terms of coming to the Heavenly Father through him. If we look back at verse 13 and 14, the, the prayer promise, whatever you ask in my name, that will I do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So we left off last week looking at that great prayer promise. We have designated May as a month of prayer. I've encouraged you to spend extra time to really begin to put your spiritual house in order in terms of prayer life. Let's develop that place and that time of seeking the Lord regularly because these promises are really, they're too great to ignore. They're too wonderful and blessed for us to just lay aside. Let us take God up on that wonderful promise. And that is followed up by verse 15, which is where we begin today. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So Jesus says, you can ask anything in my name. And then he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And let's take just a moment to talk about this. What Jesus is stating here is not legalism, but what he's stating here is that the natural outgrowth of love is the desire for one to conduct themselves in obedience to the Lord's wishes. If we're a Christian, it should naturally flow from in us that we want to please our Heavenly Father and that we do what He asks us to do because He is our perfect Heavenly Father. He can do nothing wrong. He would never tell us or direct us in a wrong way. He is only good and righteous and just and loving and graceful and gracious and merciful. And so we would naturally want to if we love him, do what he asks us to do. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. John follows this up in his smaller letter of 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3, and he says this, For this is what the love of God is. Get ready now. This is the love of God, to keep his commandments. And then he goes on and he says, And those commandments are not burdensome. They are not burdens to God's people. See, the fellowship... The, if I can use the word, the partnership, the relationship that we have with God is always rooted in love. It is bound by love. And that means God's love for us and our love for him and eventually, hopefully, and it must be, our love for one another as the family and the body of Christ. Amen. John teaches us here that, listen to me, the kind of love that God is talking about is not just a feeling or an emotion. We are so caught up in our world that we think love is all about emotion. Oh, I love you. I slobber over you because my heart is pounding and I'm sweating. And oh, I've got butterflies in my stomach. I love you. But then the next day, eh, you're okay. Ah, you, you changed your hair. Eh, it doesn't quite do it for me. Something, that's not love. The love that John is speaking of here, get this, is not a love that is just simply based on emotions or on feelings. Instead, he is saying this love that I'm talking about is based on a moral commitment. Amen. Amen. The love that God is speaking of is an ethical, moral love where we obey his commandments. If we say that we love him, we will keep his commandments and they are not burdensome to us. Amen. Just going to say this to you real quick. This is the difference between a true believer and one who maybe is struggling 
either to put on the facade and keep the facade of being a believer or they're just they're not there yet. They're not really born again, but they know instinctively that eh, I kind of need to be in church. I need to be a good person, all that kind of stuff. Here's the difference for the true believer. We may not walk perfectly, but our heart is to serve him and his commands are not burdensome. So when the Lord says, be kind, we want to be kind. We may struggle with it, but our heart's desire then, if we miss it, if someone, the Lord says, be kind, the Lord says, a gentle answer turns away wrath. If we're God's people, and that's his command, then if we blow it on that point and we blow up at someone and we get mad and we get angry, then we go away and we say, Lord, forgive me. And then we go back and we make that right with the person because his commands are not burdensome to us. We may miss it, but we move in that direction. For the unbeliever that is just simply trying to, through their own strength, attain to these things, it's always a burden. Then it does become legalism. Then it just is a system of do's and don'ts. Oh boy, God is asking me to be kind again. Oh, I don't want to be kind. Oh, I can't stand that person. Oh, but God... I don't want to do it. Now, see, if it's that type of mindset, a red flag should go up for us because that's telling us that we're not serving out of love. Instead, we're serving out of the do's and don'ts. And so Jesus here offers us something that's very, very powerful. In fact, I would say to you that the statement that Jesus is telling his disciples right here and telling us is he's not saying I'm trying to intimidate you into loving me. He's clarifying the nature of love for us. He's saying the one who truly loves God will faithfully follow, get this, my commandments. In the Greek language there, it highlights the importance of that word my. It implies that even though Jesus may physically be absent from them because he says I'm going away, he remains, nevertheless, the ultimate example for how his disciples should live their lives. So if you really love me, you will obey my commandments. Even when I'm not present physically with you, you will do that. So we've had this saying for years and years and years, WWJD, right? What would Jesus do? That's, and I know that that kind of became a trite thing, but there is a reality to that. There is a real positive to that if we can embrace it in the right way. What would Jesus do in this situation? How would Jesus act in this situation? And some people... They think they know how Jesus would react because they don't know the Jesus of the Bible. They know a Jesus they've been taught, another Jesus, who either can be overly lovey-dovey and mushy and gushy and doesn't stand for truth, or they know a Jesus who is just this hard edge. I, I saw a guy online the other day, seriously, really disturbed me. And he's forming some type of Christian militia, literally. And I heard this guy. And he's like, Jesus talked about getting your sword. It's time for us as Christians to get our swords. I'm like, wow, this guy's really misinterpreting what Jesus said. And, one, and I only know about this because uh, a brother in the church sent me the link and said, Pastor, what do you think about this? It sounds off to me. And I watched it and I said, brother, it's off. I'm glad you noticed that was off. So some people think they know Jesus, but they really don't know the Jesus of the Bible. This is why it's imperative if we're going to follow in his commandments and we're going to love him rightly, we know who he is. And that's what Jesus tells us to do. So what would Jesus do? Valid today. Unfortunately, many are not following that example. Many so-called Christians are not doing what Jesus would do. They are not keeping his commandments. He's going to go on and expound on this over the next few chapters, and he's going to talk about loving one another. He's going to talk about serving. He's going to talk about the Spirit of God, all those things. And so it's really, really important that we keep his commandments. They're not burdensome. We do it because we do love him, and the outflow of that is that we obey him. Amen. Are you with me on that? All right, good, good. Now, let's, let's dive in here, beginning in verse 16. Let's talk about this helper. Jesus says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper or comforter, your version may say, that he may be with you forever. And then he quickly defines it. That is the spirit, and that should be a capital S, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it doesn't know him, 
It doesn't see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. Folk, what a promise. Man, I mean, I'm ready to jump up and down. Je this is, I mean, Jesus gets his prayers answered. I will ask of the Father to send another comforter, another helper to you. He will give you another helper. Jesus calls the Holy Spirit here this helper or this counselor. And he says, it's another counselor, which means just as Jesus was with the disciples himself, now I'm going to give you another helper. All right, the title helper here in the, in the original language, in the Greek, is parakletos. All right, we sometimes shorten it and we say paraclete. Not parakeet. <laughs> paraclete. Can you say it with me? Paraclete. Okay, that's, that's our basic uh, English Southern way of, of use, saying that Greek word. It literally means, the word literally means one called alongside to help. It's a rich word. There's a lot of, of shades with this word, a lot of varied meanings with it. In fact, depending on your version of the scriptures, it may be translated a little differently, and all of these are valid. I'm going to give you some of the spiritual roles here that this uh, word takes on. Counselor, which I mentioned. Helper, I mentioned. Strengthener. Comforter. Advisor. Advocate, which, by the way, I think might be closest to the best rendering of the word, an advocate, intercessor, ally, and even close friend. All these words express what that word parakletos actually means. And there are three points to this that I want to share with you that Jesus expounds on, and I want to mention these to you. The first one is this. Jesus says that that other comforter, another comforter, is yet to come. The paraclete, this helper, can only come after Jesus departs. We'll get to that when we read in John 16. And it's after Jesus' work is finished. Jesus makes it clear. I have to go to Calvary first. I have to die for the sins of the world. But upon that work being done, then the Holy Spirit will come to you. This helper will come. But he cannot come before then to them in the way that Jesus wants him to come. So the paraclete is characteristic of the new covenant. This is something that could not happen before Jesus died on Calvary. You had the followers of God, the people of God. You had the Abrahams and Isaacs and Jacobs and the King Davids and all of these people that served God. And there are times where the Spirit of God would come upon a person. That's usually the type of language that would be used in the Old Testament. So if someone wanted to prophesy, if the Isaiah, someone was going to prophesy, what would happen is the Spirit of God would come upon them. And then they would speak the words of the Lord. But there's nothing in the Old Testament really about the Holy Spirit coming and abiding in that person from that moment onward. That was a little bit foreign to them. They knew who the Holy Spirit was. They understood the Spirit of God. But he did not come to abide. Jesus says, once I go, I will ask of the Father, and then this other helper will come and will abide with you. But Jesus has to go first. This is the new covenant that we live under. In many ways, we now live in the age of the Spirit. The New Testament times, the times in which we live now, the last days, did you know we're in the last days? Yes. It's not just because you read in the news and it's, it's actually Bible. The last days started on the day of Pentecost. And the apostle Peter, he quoted from Joel the prophet. And he said, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. We are living in the last days. It's the age of the spirit. The Holy Spirit comes. He comes and he indwells us. He comes and he fills us. We are living in an incredible time that the Old Testament saints, I would say, longed to see. They longed to see the Messiah come. They longed to see the redemption of Israel, all of these things. But a part of it is the Holy Spirit has come. The Comforter has come. What a wonderful thing. But Jesus makes it clear that he was yet to come here in John 14, but he will come after Jesus finishes his work. By the way, Remember Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And that's born of the Spirit. That's implied in John chapter 3. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, we kind of have this summed up for us. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. 
When you are genuinely saved, when you are genuinely born again, the Spirit of God comes to abide within you. The Spirit of God comes to dwell within you. So, bottle of water here, it's already got some water in it. The bottle is you and I. The water is the Spirit. So the Spirit is poured into us. We are saved. Inside, we, we have the Spirit of God dwelling within us. Now, another work of the Spirit, since it is Pentecost Sunday, and this is not the primary emphasis of the text here, but I want to get this in because it is Pentecost Sunday. It would be like you and I, filled with the Spirit internally, we're the bottle, then taking the bottle and tossing it out into the ocean that is filled with water, powerful water, with waves that can take it here and take it there. That would be like being filled with the Spirit, being baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's a different work. It's a work of an overflowing that God does to lead and to guide and to direct us. Amen? Amen. And he empowers us for specific purposes, specific moments in time as I read in the book of Acts. Amen? Amen? And so God wants us to be filled. In fact, he wants us to keep being filled, Ephesians says. Be being filled with the Spirit. So internally, we had the Spirit at salvation. All of us had that. But then there's also a filling of the Spirit that God desires to work in us and work through us for his glory and honor. Amen? Amen. But, but, but here, Jesus is speaking specifically of the Spirit coming and now kind of as it was being in the place of Jesus. Because you and I, if we were here right now, or if we were here and we said, if Jesus was right here beside me, boy, I wouldn't worry about one demon. I wouldn't worry about one problem. I got Jesus right here. No problems, man. I'm not worried about any of it. He is here by his Holy Spirit. Another helper, another comforter. And that's the second point I want to bring up is this comforter would do for the disciples in the future what Jesus has done for them in the present while he is with them. The Holy Spirit will abide. That means he will be by and stay and remain and continue with them. I like how one commentator wrote it. The ministry of the Spirit would be directed primarily to the disciples, not to the world, to the disciples. He would direct their, he would direct their decisions, counsel them continually, and remain with them forever. See, Jesus was only there for a short time before he had to do his work and then go back up to heaven. But the Holy Spirit comes and abides forever with his people. The Spirit would be invisible to all and un, un, um, unapprehended by the world at large since the world would not recognize him. To use a modern metaphor, this author says, he would not operate on the world's wavelength. His presence was already with the disciples insofar as they were under his influence. How? Through Jesus. Because Jesus was filled with the Spirit, wasn't he? Jesus was directed by the Holy Spirit. So in that sense, this, the Spirit is with them in and through Jesus. But later he would indwell them when Jesus himself had departed. And of course, again, this distinction marks the difference between the Old Testament experience and, of course, the New Testament experience, the individual indwell, uh, indwelling and, and then the filling of the Spirit is specifically a privilege for the believer. And how many can say amen? Aren't you grateful? Aren't you thankful? We're not doing it alone. We're not just a person trying to serve God who's way out there. God has come to dwell with us. And then thirdly, I'm going to make this one more point to you here, because he says in verse 16... I'll ask the Father and he will give you another. I want to focus just for a second on that word another. Because what that, that word means is one of the same kind. So he says this comforter that will come is in like manner as Jesus. He's another of the same kind of advocate, paraclete, comforter, helper. And this qualification demands not only that the paraclete is the spirit, but also that the paraclete is more than just a spirit. He is God. He and Jesus are one, just as Jesus and the Father are one. That means Jesus, that means the Spirit and the Father are one. Hence, you know what we have right here? We've got the Trinity. There's no denying it. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they work in conjunction. That also tells me this, that the Spirit does the work as if Jesus were still here on the earth. Well, why is that important? 
Because now we've got people out there that are saying, you know, all the gifts of the Spirit have ceased. All the working of God. God doesn't perform miracles anymore. He doesn't heal anybody anymore. He doesn't do any of that anymore. People do not speak in tongues. They don't give a word of wisdom. All that is gone. That's done with. And I had big, one big word to say to all these people that believe that. You guys know me well. Baloney! Baloney! My Greek word for baloney. Of course, God still operates the same. Jesus said, I will give you another helper, one of the same kind, to basically, as it was, in a sense, take my place, and he will be with you forever. He will abide with you forever. So Jesus is not leaving his disciples, but he is magnifying his presence and his work among them through this great promise. And that takes us to verse 18 then. So you know him, the world doesn't know him, but you know him, he abides with you, he will be in you. Verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come again to you. I'm not going to leave you fatherless. I'm coming back, really, to you, amen? Orphans were severely mistreated. Certainly in that day and age, sadly, even today. Orphans, you don't have a father. Hey, my mom and dad divorced, I don't mind telling you, when I was only about four years old. My mom gained custody, brought me down here to Florida from Virginia. Um, no brothers or sisters. A mom that had to work. I understand what it means in that sense to be fatherless. Now, I knew my father, but I only got to meet with him two or three weeks a year during the summertime. Very tough. It, it's tough to have no one to back you up and to help you and to teach you and to give you guidance and, and help. And I mean, my mom did her best. I, I love her to death, but it's not the same as having a father. Back in those days, orphans, that was the roughest of the rough. Jesus says, guys, I am not going to leave you orphanless. You are not going to be by yourselves when I go. I am sending Another like me, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, and he will come and he will be in you. And I love that so much. Their protector. Jesus is saying, I have no intention of abandoning you. You ever been abandoned? You ever been like, have your little posse with you? And here's some guy and, and you say, guys, we can take him, right? And then, guys, guys, everybody else is gone? That's not the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, I'm not going to abandon you. He's with us always. Hallelujah. I'm so grateful and thankful. The spirit of the living God. Jesus is with us by way of the spirit of God. And so we can say Jesus dwells within us. Christ within us. By and through his spirit. You cannot separate Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's beyond our comprehension. So God is with us. And how so? We get to the next verse, verse 19. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. And because I live, you will live also. Now, there are a couple of ways to look at this. After a little while, uh, the world won't see me, but you'll see me. So, you know, what is that referring to? Because there's really kind of three things it could refer to. It could refer to, you won't see me until the resurrection. It might mean... Uh, when you do see me, it's by the Holy Spirit that you'll see me. Or it might mean at the end. Remember he says in, in John 14, those first couple of verses, uh, you know, I'll go to prepare a place for you and come again to receive you. So it might mean a second coming. And I think it could mean all of those, but I think specifically in this verse, in verse 19, he is referring to the resurrection. There's going to be a time period where you're not going to see me, but then you are going to see me again, but the world will not. And we know for a fact that Jesus never revealed himself to the world again after he was raised from the dead. He did it beforehand. And do you remember when he gave the Jewish people all kinds of warnings? He said, you better walk in the light while the light is with you. And in a little while, you will not have the light anymore and there'll be darkness. Jesus was telling them, while I am with you, now is the time to make your choice. But after he was raised from the dead, he only appeared to his disciples. He appeared to some of his family members who became disciples or were disciples at that point in time. But other than that, there's no record of him appearing to unsaved people other than Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul. Amen? But, but Jesus does, did not appear to them. So he says, the world's not going to see me anymore. But you guys will see me. And not only that, but as because I live, you guys are going to live. 
You're going to go through the ringer. You're going to be thrown in the slammer. Eventually, some of you are going to die for your faith, but you're still going to live because my spirit is living within you. My life is within you, and you will live. This world is not living. What we are doing is existing, basically. The life that Jesus is talking about is eternal life, the life of God. Because I live, you will live. Hallelujah. How many here have the life of God within them right now? Isn't that wonderful? It's awesome. He says, you're going to see, you're going to believe, and you're going to eventually receive the Spirit, by the way. And they received the Spirit. And John will read about this uh, later on in John, where, where after Jesus is raised from the dead, he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Personally, I think that's when they were literally born again. That's just my view on it. You don't have to agree with me on that. And then, of course, we know on the day of Pentecost, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So these things take place. Now we move then from verse 18. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you after a little while. Verse 19, the world's not going to see me. You're going to see me because I live. You will also live. And now we move to verse 20. In that day, you will know that I am in the Father, in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Again, on that day, on the day of his resurrection, okay, yeah, on the day when the Spirit is poured out? Yeah. On the day when he returns, all of that can be true. Amen. Usually that phraseology, on that day, we read, that, that can be apocalyptic, meaning dealing with end time events. You read in some of the Old Testament prophets like Isaiah. I was reading earlier in Isaiah. On that day, on that day, over and over again. And it's speaking of the final days. It's speaking of God and his glory and his majesty and all that he's going to do. And that, by the way, is, took place in Jesus' day through the cross. And it will take place when he returns. Amen. It could, that in and of itself on that day can have multiple meanings. But Jesus says in that day or on that day, you will know that I am in my father and you in me and I in you. You're going to know it beyond any shadow of a doubt. Folk, this is the whole point of Christianity. It's experiential. It is not just in the mind. God, the relationship that God has with us, Jesus says you will know it. Couldn't we say already they've, they've walked with Jesus three and a half years. He's spoken about his relationship with the Father and that he and the Father are one. But clearly they may in their mind agree because they're not going to disagree with Jesus. But Jesus says in that day you'll know it. There will be something that will happen. What is that something? The Spirit of God will come into your life. And you will experience something. Number one, the new birth. You will be born again. There's nobody that has been born again that doesn't know it. You show me somebody that, well, yeah, I think back when I was 30, I think I was saved back then. I, I'm not really sure. But, you know, I just kind of casually. As any, you know, I know some of you ladies probably maybe had a rough birth of one of your children where you were in there for a few hours. That's pretty rough, isn't it? Yeah. Not fun, is it? I don't know. Has anybody been literally in, in labor for over 24 hours? Any of you ladies? A couple of you? Oh, Lord bless you. Anybody had to go 48 hours? Whew. I bet you the 24, for the, that was more than enough. You thought that was over, right? Yeah. 48 hours. Can you imagine someone, well, I was born over the course of many years. No. <laughs> Listen, it doesn't work that way. When you are born again of the Spirit of God, it there is a moment in time where that takes place. And I read nowhere in the Bible where anyone says, oh, wow, you know what? I, I, I've been born again for years and I didn't know it. <laughs> of course you know it. In that day, you will know that I am the Father one. So there's all of a sudden, that, that which Jesus knows, that knowledge of the intimacy of he and the Father, and he and the Holy Spirit, and the Holy, all, on that day, when the Holy Spirit comes into us, we come into the family, and then we know experientially that everything that Jesus said is true. And we can call that assurance. It's the assurance of salvation, isn't it? I, I believe in that fully, and you, you have to have it. I'm, I'm, some of the things we have lost in the 20th and the 21st century is this thing of praying through when people need to get saved. 
I feel sorry for these people that they think that the guy on TV that preaches his prosperity message or whatever nonsense he's preaching at the very end, he tacks on with a big smile, if you know who I'm thinking of in Houston. And now let me just pray. Ask Jesus into your heart. If you ask him into your heart, you are saved in 10 seconds. Woo! Wow! I'm not trying to be smart with you here, but I'm trying to make a point that when we come into the kingdom of God, something radical happens because the spirit comes to dwell within us. We are born again. It is an experience. We have not a head knowledge, but a, a, a heart knowledge of the things of God. We are adopted into the family. Hallelujah. I've been adopted into the family, and so I can say, Abba, Father, from my heart of hearts. I know that I know that I know that I know that I'm saved. Amen? <laughs> Folks, there's nothing like it. It's wonderful. We know that we know that we know that we are saved. And then not only that, but then I'll say the same thing about being filled with the Spirit. I see nothing in the New Testament of anyone that was filled with the Spirit and didn't know it. <laughs> same thing. Well, I, I got filled, but I didn't know it. It's, it's a radical thing. Things happen and transpire and take place. Amen? And, and it changes us. I mean, radical, radical change in us. And so when the Spirit comes to indwell us at salvation, and when we are filled with the Spirit, which happens on multiple occasions or should, it's, it's radical. It's real. And then we come to know that Jesus and the Father are one. We come to know also that Jesus is in us. And we are in him. Amen. Hallelujah. Nothing greater than that. Amen. Jesus and I. Amen. And it's not about me. It's about him. Jesus and you, you know, you've heard the old thing. Jesus and me make a majority or whatever. No, Jesus is the majority. Forget the and you. It's just I'm on the inside. Jesus is the majority. And if I'm with him, hallelujah, then I'm on the majority side. Amen. That's what Jesus is saying to the disciples right here. So powerful, you will know me. And so if we were to sum up these verses, verses 16 through 20 right here, just to kind of sum it up, Jesus is saying that, that in the period after his death, the people of God will be taken care of because the Spirit will take the place of Jesus among them and the Spirit will watch over them. Moreover, every one of the disciples will be protected because they will not be alone. You are not alone. If you're a Christian, you are not alone today. God is with you. Not only that, but Jesus Christ will come back. He does that through the resurrection. He does that through the indwelling of the Spirit of God. He says, I'll be with you. And he says, I'll come to you, not to the world, but I'll come to you and give you new life. And that new life will continue. It will begin and continue through the indwelling of this other, another paraclete, another helper, the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Can we thank God for that? Amen. How wonderful is that? This is a promise that up to this point, this is revolutionary. But this is basically revolutionary. Early on, Jesus talked about baptizing and John the Baptist baptizing uh, you know, by fire and all this kind of stuff. But this is pretty revolutionary, and it's very intimate as Jesus is speaking to his disciples. You can't communicate the reality of this to those that don't believe. They don't understand it. They don't have the experience. They can't comprehend it. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. They're spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So, so an unbeliever, Jesus says, I'm not coming to the world uh, to reveal myself to them. The only work that the Spirit does in the world is to convict them of sin and righteousness and judgment. And that's the only work that the Spirit really does in terms of the unbelieving world. But for the believer, we have fellowship with him. And there's nothing greater than that. And then we want to bookend it by looking at verse 21 once more. Kind of a little bit of a, of a repeat of verse 15. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father. And I will love him and I will disclose myself to him. Again, can we say it, folks? Are you ready? Get ready for this. This is big. This is my, you might want to write this down. This is mind blowing right here. Obeying Jesus Christ's commands is not optional for those that want to experience the life of Christ. It cannot be optional. Well, I want Jesus as my Savior, but not my Lord. Ha! There is no such thing. 
There is no such thing in the New Testament. I used to hang out with a guy that went to a a distinctly non-Pentecostal church. Good guy. And, and, And I believe he loved the Lord. But in his church, they taught a very easy believism. And they just taught everyone to expect to go out and sin it up like crazy every week and don't worry about it. Because once you're in the grasp of God, you're always in the grasp of God. Once shaved, always shaved. You've heard about that, right? The guy that was shaved by the barber, Grace, went in and got the shave. And a week later, no stubble. And the next week, no stubble. And like, what is going on? And was telling his friend about it. And his friend said, oh, I want to go to that barber. And he said, yeah, because once you're shaved by grace, you've always been shaved by grace. Just once. <laughs> And so, so this, this guy went to this kind of church. You're just going to sin. Just go ahead and sin. And, and the saying in that church was, you know, for most of you, Jesus is your savior. You, you've got the life, the, the fire insurance. You're not going to hell. Keep it in your back pocket there. So he's your savior, but he's not your Lord. And so they would go around and say, I've made Jesus my savior, but he's not quite Lord. Again, I say, baloney. This is so clear, is it not? He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one that loves me. Again, are we talking sinless perfection? No. Because other than Jesus and me, I don't know anyone else. No. (laughs) Other than Jesus only. Other than Jesus, I don't know anyone that has been able to do that. So that's not what we're talking about. But we're talking about a heart that's predisposed. That if we really love him, it's going to flow out of us. We are going to keep his commandments. It is not optional if we want that eternal life with God, that flowing life with the Lord. And so Donald Stamps is helpful here real quickly about this. He says, number one, obedience to Christ, though never perfect in this life, must still be wholehearted and genuine. It's an essential aspect of our faith in him, and it's a reflection of true love for him. Remember Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who, what, does the will of my Father who is in heaven. That person will enter in. All right? Important that we get that love and that we understand that love is the greatest and only effective motivation for obeying Christ's commands. You cannot whip it into people. You cannot scare it into people. You cannot force it. Love is the only motivation that will allow you and I to serve him effectively. Amen? Are you with me on that? Number two, trying to follow the commands without a deep love for Christ is indeed legalism. We're just following the details of the law without a true commitment to the spirit of God behind it. Remember, uh, Paul writes and he says, what does the letter do? The letter kills It's the Holy Spirit that gives life. If the letter alone would do it, then there would have been no need for the new covenant because all the Old Testament saints that had their scriptures could have kept it. Not a one of them could. There's not a one of them that could keep it. They all sinned. They all fell short. We need the Spirit of God within us because if we're only trying to do it through our own strength, it's just going to lead to frustration and to failure. And then number three, to the person who loves Christ and strives to obey his commands consistently, Jesus promises a special love, grace, and his deepest inner presence. You see, love and obedience always go together when it comes to genuine commitment to Jesus Christ. If there's genuine love for the Lord, there will be loving obedience. Can I get an amen on that? All right, I'm going to ask Sister Ann to come up, but I'm just going to ask you, have you experienced the promise that Jesus gave to his disciples here? Have you experienced another helper? Have you experienced the indwelling of the Spirit of God in your life? That's where I want to start. Have you been born again? Do you know that you know that you know that you have a helper, you have the Spirit of God within you that allows you to cry out with a clean conscience, Abba, Father, God is my Father. I may not be perfect, but I know that I know that I know I'm going to heaven. See, that's the acid test. Do you know for sure? The Christian says, yes, I do, because the inner witness of the Spirit tells me I'm a child of God. And then, are you filled with the Spirit? Are you being filled regularly? That's not only a promise of God, but that too is a command of God. I'm not going to preach a whole nother message, but at the end of Luke, Jesus tells the disciples as he's getting ready to head back up to heaven, He says, guys, I want you to tarry in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. 
Don't go out and try and do the work, the commission of preaching the gospel to the whole world until you are powered up. The car ain't going anywhere until there's gas in it. You and I are not doing anything for the Lord, effective and long-lasting, until the Spirit of God is being poured out in this filling. We're, we're saved, and He indwells us, but we need to be filled on a regular basis. Just this great outworking. Have you experienced that today? How is your life with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, your life with God, how is it at home? Is the Father, is the Son, is the Spirit... Are they like owners or are they just tenants, just renting out for a little bit in your life? Oh, I, you know, on Sunday, you know, we're, we're in church together. We're like this. Monday, I kind of do my own thing. The Holy Spirit comes to abide forever. How about on a scale of one to 10? What's your peace quotient right now? Where are you at with peace, inner peace in your heart right now because Jesus says when he when the spirit comes we're going to keep reading this he's going to bring peace he's going to bring joy we should not be running around with our hair on fire because of everything happening in the world as Christians we should be the stable ones saying you know what yeah that's bad I'm concerned I'm praying but I know who's coming back and is going to make it all right and I already have the spirit of God indwelling me so I'm not going to run around and and scream and shout like the rest of the world no how is your peace quotient right now one to ten where are you at you got the 10 or maybe you had a five. Maybe you're down at a three or two or worse. The Holy Spirit dwelling within us. Has the Holy Spirit, how? If, if so, has the Holy Spirit made Jesus more real to you? And if so, how? How is Jesus more real to you now than before you were saved? Or maybe even before you've been filled with the Spirit because all these things are real. The Holy Spirit is the revealer of Jesus. You want to draw closer and know the Lord more? Allow him by his spirit to do every bit of work he wants to do in your life and in your heart. Amen. And then finally, I'm just going to ask you to bow your head for a moment. Close your eyes just so we can concentrate. But just one more question. Today, do you need the work of this paraclete, this counselor, this advocate Advocate meaning even in a legal sense, he's like the lawyer, both defense and prosecution, but bringing you before the Father saying, I'm going to be your advocate. Do you need the counselor, the advocate, the helper? How about the comforting work of the Spirit? How about the fact that he's the truth teller? Do you need him today? With heads bowed and eyes closed, do you need more of the working of the Spirit of God in your life today? I'm not asking you to raise your hand. I'm telling you my hand is up because I'm just being honest. I, I need more and more of the Lord today. Spirit of the living God, would you fall fresh on us? If you are not a believer, today is the day to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you need to, to come and see me. If you're not a believer and you know that today is the day, you need to come and see me after this service. I will stay up here with you. I want to show you what the Bible says and I want to pray for you. For the Lordship of Christ to come into your life. I want, I want to see you saved, born again. And if you're a believer and you just need more of the Holy Spirit of God, can we just spend a couple of minutes with the Lord? You can make an altar right there uh, in your seat. If you want to come forward, you can. I'm just going to stand up here and just pray as well, asking God to minister to me because I need more of him. I need that advocate. That, that, uh, and I know he's with me, but I just need more of him in my life. Would you just pray and ask God just to minister to you today and to grant to you the fullness of the Spirit of God, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Father, I come to you, Lord. Would you do this great work in my life and in the lives of your people? What a promise. Jesus, you've prayed to the Father and he has sent another helper, another advocate, another of you, Jesus, as if you were physically, literally right here walking with us. He has sent the Holy Spirit to indwell us so we know you now and we need you. We express it. We need you. I need you more and more and more. I need your counsel. I need your comfort and your encouragement, your peace, your protection, your guidance, your strength. Lord, I need all these things. I want, Lord, I want to grow in you. 
not going to stand still. I want to grow in you because I know standing still means really going backwards. No, no, Lord. More of you, more of you, Lord. If you desire more of the Lord, just, just right there in your seat, if you would stand, if you're able to, if you can't, but, but to lift up your hands or just some acknowledgement, just more of the Spirit of God in your life. I'm, I've got my hands raised and I just want us to pray and then we're going to sing out this song that Sister Ann is playing, but can we just pray together? I believe there's something to that. Pray for yourself, but then also pray for the person next to you that wants this as well.